I made a promise that uh, Mama Phoebe would come, and she has come, because I wanted you to know that for the last 51 years, Mama Phoebe and I have lived together and still love one another. And in my journey with her, I learned that every anniversary of our marriage and wedding on the 3rd of June, I should take her for a honeymoon. <laughs> Whereas men forget anniversaries, women don't. And so if you want to remind yourself as a man, then do not forget the anniversary. God has given us four children, two boys and two girls. The oldest is 50, the youngest alive is 44. So our baby is 44. <laughs> and then somebody is going to say, Bishop, are you really telling us the truth? Yes, I'm telling you the truth. Because I know Jesus Christ and I do not lie. But my heart is so thankful to be in UCU, which used to be Bishop Tucker Theological College when I was a student here. And when my son, Paul, the chaplain, invited me to come, first in February, it did not work because it was too quick and too abrupt. Then when they extended it to October, then I asked the administration that if I should come for the graduation, please bring it closer to the mission week. They said, yes, we will. So next week, I'm also going to be here for the graduation. I have found a home away from home, credit to the administration. You have kept this university clean, organized, and very beautiful. I am so thankful for the community here in the university, for your diligence, for your discipline, and for your commitment to God. I am proud of Uganda Christian University as a second chancellor and I've graduated quite a large number of people. In the nine years, I was the archbishop and the chancellor. But then to come back as a retired man and still look at people whom I have met and known for years, including them there, I feel as extremely gratified. You gave me a good topic today to look at, and I'm going to deal with that topic and not exegete the, te uh, the text. I'm going to deal with the topic and not exegete the text. Relationship that adds value is your topic you gave me. Relationship that adds value starts with us knowing, you and I, that we are made for relationship. You and I are made for relationship. Nobody's an island. Professor Beatty said, I am because you are. Since you are, therefore I am. We are made to relate because each one of us belongs to a family somewhere. And in our context in this country, you also come from a clan somewhere. And you have a tribe, whether north like me, or central like you, or west like some of you, or east. We come from a tribe, and we are from nations. We are in Uganda, we are Ugandans, we have overseas people here who come from other parts of the world. And that, I think, is why this university is excellent, because there is cross-pollination taking place here. I bless God for the community like you see your family that we have here. In the days when I was a chancellor, we would meet in the field on the other side. So we belong. We are in relationship. Why? Because God is a relational God. In the Trinity, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this relationship can never be corrupted. It's always intact, it's always dynamic, it's always on the move. And then God himself made you and I to relate to him. We have the capacity to connect to God. We have the capacity to speak to God. That relationship was a great honeymoon in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve enjoyed that relationship until one day, sin entered that family, sin entered that garden. And the first thing that was destroyed when sin entered that garden was relationship. Adam and Eve dis 
suddenly discovered they were naked and they became afraid. That was when fear for the first time entered into the garden and into the relationship between the man and his wife. Now I want you to know that God will never force you into a relationship. You make your own choice to relate to him. You are free not to relate to him. And I know that because we are that free, we make a choice. You choose who to relate to. One of the best things I found extremely therapeutic for my spirit when I was here is that we had different tribes of this country in this place. I come from Alur. If you do not know them, see me here. They are, we are in Nebi. We are a very small tribe. The actually the Langis are bigger than us, but we are in Nebi, West Nile. I never related deeply with my people because by blood we are also already related. I had Bachiga, I had Banyankole, I had Bagisu, I had Baganda, I had Basoga as friends. I wanted to build across my own tribe and extend my own experience. Now, if you are still controlled by the boundary of your tribe and you are in this particular university, think twice. Go beyond that boundary. Extend beyond. Because now, in this university, we have the continent of Africa represented. Stretch out there. But you can choose who to relate to. You can choose when to relate. You can also choose how to relate. Those are choices we make, but every choice has consequences. Because we sharpen one another, for better or for worse. As iron sharpens iron, we sharpen one another. As we relate to each other, we are sharpening one another. And I want you to understand something which is biblically the history of humanity. Adam and Eve made a wrong choice. And that choice, because it was wrong, has affected humanity. They chose to relate with Satan because they listened to the devil. And what did they lose? They lost the garden. And losing the garden, they lost peace and they lost contentment. Now as a result, the divine connection between God and Adam and Eve were destroyed. We know that when we read the scripture, they were chased out of the Garden of Eden. Now let me give you a fast, quick picture. In the Garden of Eden, they disobeyed God. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, when second Adam came, he prayed to bring us back to the original relationship with God. He obeyed God. And when he obeyed God, then he brought us back to the relationship that we needed. But beloved, relationship is very painful. A mother experiences pain when she is pushing life out of her body. There is no hallelujah, there is no laughing when she's pushing. I hear it is a cry and a sweat and blood and it is tough. So some people opt for C-section instead of natural giving birth because they think it's tough, I'm told. I have no experience and I will not have experience, of course. <laughs> I'm even told some of them push in English, and they say, this is the last one. <laughs> but then I'm told after the baby is born, that one is forgotten. Because the joy of having a baby takes over the pain momentarily you go through. But relationship can be painful. A broken relationship can break a heart. And so many hearts are so fragile, especially women's hearts are fragile. I have never found men whose hearts are broken. Ours are like stone and hide and tough. Now I'll tell you why. The reason why women's heart can easily break is because women are relational. Women relate very well. Go to any place, find women sitting together, they are talking to one another. Get together and find men sitting together. They're talking to their phones. You can never say anything to one another. Women are relational. That's why their hearts break. And the pain of a heartbreak is a real pain. Other pains are rejection. And rejection are created and they come with bitterness and anger and fear. Wait. 
when you are rejected. Now, many of us carry heavy burdens because of betrayal in relationship. A promise never kept makes you carry a burden of bitterness in your heart. I had an uncle at the age of 11. I went and worked in his cotton garden and worked very hard and he made a promise to me. I was very young. He took me to the tailor to make uniform for me. He never paid for it. He never paid for it. So I had to go home without that uniform promised by my uncle. When I was already a bishop, I still remembered and I reminded him. I said, uncle, do you remember that time when I was still young? You made a promise. Parents never make promises that you don't keep. Because children don't forget. Try not to if you can. If you can't deliver, don't make it. So betrayal in relationship because of broken promises can be so painful. That's why Paul wants you and me about the company we should have. Here in the reading, Paul says, believers relating with unbelievers is incompatible. If you are a believer and you relate with an unbeliever intimately, it is dangerous because according to Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, he said, bad company ruins good character. Bad company ruins good character. And often in a community like ours, with us having all these visions for tomorrow, we have peer pressures. Now, common opinion is not necessarily common sense. What people go for may not necessarily be the thing you need in life. You need to make your own decision to see repercussions and consequences of issues. And I want to ask you a question, who do you want to follow in life? Who is your role model? Today we have a problem. Today we have crisis. There are very few real role models to follow. My role model was Janani Loom. He died quickly. I was a student here. I had another role model called Galpin, Alan Galpin, whose, whose place of health is up here. He died here. I had another friend who was Crispo Ozele, a very good role model to me. He died. So one day I asked God, why do you take people I look to? You took Janani, you took Alan Galpin, you took Crispo. You know what he told me? I want you to look to me. I want you to look to me. So ever since, I began to look to Jesus as my role model, as my mentor. I ask him to disciple me, I ask him to train me, I ask him to help me. Who do you look to and who do you follow? Now secondly, righteousness and wickedness do not relate. Righteousness and wickedness do not relate because they do not have a common denominator. You are either righteous or wicked. You are either an orange or a lemon. Thirdly, light and darkness do not share the same bedroom. No, they don't. When the sun is out, darkness has receded. Wait until the sun sets over there and it comes back again. They don't share anything in common. And I want to say to you, fourthly, that worshipping of Christ does not mix with worshipping of idols. Because God, sorry, because God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. I am an Anglican, born and bred one, still in service in an Anglican setting. I have many, many nominal Anglicans who are Anglicans on Sunday, on Christmas and Easter. And after that, they are on their own doing what they like. Are you a Christian? Oh, yes. Are you a Moloko? Of course not. Those are stupid guys. Me, I'm a true Anglican. Now, by definition, a, a true Anglican should be a Christian. A Christian should have Christ as their role model. Should in, imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. And so do not mix, because they don't mix. You cannot mix oil with water and it functions. You cannot mix sugar with salt and it functions very well. No, you cannot mix. God expects us to worship him. 
God does not expect us to watch, worship creatures which are out around us. Not even things we make with our own hands like the phone, like the tablet, like the computer, like the cars, like the building we build. Not even your wife and husband and children. No, you don't need to worship them. Now, what is worship? Worship is that person in whom your mind is consumed all the time. When you wake up in the morning, what is in your mind? What takes your energy in thinking will be the idol that you're going to worship if it is not God. So when you worship God, you begin to understand what it means not to mix up with other things. I was preaching in all sense last month. I asked a man, I was doing a men's conference and they came in many number. I said, man, should I ask you, and I put a basket over there, and then I put another basket over there for you to drop your phones there, and I keep it for one week. Is it going to be possible? Oh, the mama was big man's mama, because it is, it is not possible, because many of us are clinging to our phone, even using it as pillows at night. I have told my bishops, if you let your phone on 24-7, then you make yourself look like you are on call. Emergency services is not necessary. That phone has a capacity to be switched off and on. You can never be ruled by a phone because you are bigger than a phone, you are more important than a phone. It's a very useful tool, but can also become a very big enemy to you. Never worship things we make, the gadgets we have, the big cars you, perhaps you have, the house you have built, that's not an, that's an idol, not a subject of worship, no. That's why I want you to know yourself. Know who you are according to what the word of God tells me. Do you know Paul is saying you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That God does not dwell in a building constructed by human hands, no. He dwells in me, he dwells in you. According to verse 19 there, in verse 19 there, it talks about we being the temple of God. 16 actually. No, 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 yeah, 16. We are the temple of God. What does that really mean? That means that I make a choice and I ask God to come into my life. To control me. Because I don't know how to control myself. It's hard to control myself. And then according to Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians in his first letter, in verse 20 and chapter 6, let me read something for you. It will help you to understand what I'm trying to talk about. 6.20. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. In verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You are very precious to God. Your name is written in the book of life. You are recognized in heaven. And my friend, they may not know you in this university. It does not matter. I may not know you. The VC may not know you. The professors here may not know you. It doesn't matter as long as God knows you. You are recognized. And God wants to use you and now this is where my punch point is. Younger people whom I'm seeing here, God wants to use you to bring transformation and redemption first to your family. Secondly, to this nation. And where need be to the whole world, including Africa. God wants to use you. God wants to use you. You know, when I was growing up, I thought I was a nobody. Because my circumstances were slightly difficult. I could not afford a pair of shoes until I was 18. And I was in college. All along I walked barefooted. I saw people with shoes, I did not know how they felt. So I rated myself from the point of not having shoes, therefore I am poor. The answer is I was not. I was passing through a phase. Other things were not there for me. And I thought I was poor, but I am not. That was my daddy and my mommy, not me. When I became me, I began to look different. 
I began to act different. I began to acquire totally differently. In my family, my father's uh, family car was a bicycle. And when I, I told my father I wanted to be a priest, he was so upset with me. He said, why do you choose the path of poverty? You're a teacher, you'd have gone up there and you'll be a man earning every month and you'll be a lot better. Now when I stand in my home and I look around, I wish my father never died. So that he could see who the son is now today. Now you may not be what God wants you to be yet, but the time is coming. The time is coming when who you are will come out because it is still all built within your system and it is coming. And I want to know, together with you, that better days are yet to come. Okay, at my age, you may say, ah, but Henry or Luke or Romby, what haven't you seen? Of course, I have seen so much, but I haven't seen it all. I'm still expectant. I still feel there is something I need to grasp. I still feel I am pushing on until I get there. I haven't yet said, like Paul, I have fight a good, I've fought a good fight. I've run the race. I have kept my faith. I've not come there yet. So the better days, even for me, are yet to come. Much more for you that God will use you irrespective of what you look like now and what you have now. May I ask you never to look down upon yourself. And may I also ask you never to allow anybody look down upon you. No, it's not true. Therefore, this is what I'm going to request you to do. Number one, will you glorify God with your body? And please don't misuse it. Will you glorify God with your body? And please don't misuse it. Don't allow anyone, don't allow anyone to cheapen your body. Whether you're a man or a woman, or a boy or a girl, do not allow anyone to cheapen your body. How? Now sometimes we reduce ourselves to nothing. When we expose our nakedness to anybody, anytime. You are reducing yourself to nothing. That's not you. Do not do that. Some of us are drinking and using poison in our system for a short time of pleasure which fleets and goes. And the more you do it, you become addicted and you can no longer control yourself. And yet God has given you the capacity to control yourself. When I was young, both my father, both sides, mother's, mother's side and, and father's side, were men who were walking in occultism. So they cut my body. They cut my hands. They made marks on my face. Whatever they did that for, I did not know. But I came to understand they wanted me to identify with the spirits of, of our home. Those powers are very strong. If you are Ugandan and you are an African, I'm going to address this to you. Some of you are being controlled without knowing it. A lot of it is from your past. A lot of it is from your ancestor. It comes in terms of things like uncontrollable anger, reckless life of immorality, the ability to fight needlessly, those things which you think after all, this is not logical. Why is it coming like that? My friend, it could have not been your problem. It got into your DNA, and it is controlling you. We have those inheritance. Some of us delve in occultic activities through demonic activities. And it is very common today to be caught up by demonic activities through music. Some of the music are from hell and they are dangerous and they can hook you and they can make you an addict. And some of us worship cultic figures. Nowadays we have so many pseudo prophets of one type or another and they do not point you to Jesus, they point you to themselves. Instead of worshiping Christ, you worship them. Beware, because those are already idols that stand as a block between you and God. And some of us are into gambling. And I hope that that's not what you are going through. There are many others. I think those are enough for you. But do you know that you can actually live supernaturally in this natural life? That there is a way 
you can live supernaturally in this natural life through the Spirit of God. If you surrender yourself to Christ, Christ will look after you. If you give your lives to Jesus, Christ will look after you. One day I was driving from Nebi coming into Kampala. I did not know that I passed through an ambush during the days when they used to ambush vehicles in Mashishon National Park. I passed through that ambush. A bastard came after me shortly after that, entered the ambush, and people were killed. We passed through. Now, will you say I was lucky? But I will explain to you what I saw earlier on. Earlier on, as an archdeacon, I took a bishop for a confirmation by the lake called Lake Albert. Unknown to me, there were two wizards among the confirmees. Now, if you don't know wizards, these are agents of evil powers that work. Me, I know they work. How do I know they work? Because Satan is alive and well. And he's still working. So I came with the bishop. We sat down. Now, unknown to me, these boys had purpose in their hearts to hurt me by casting a, a spell and kill me. It did not work. One day, one of them got saved. And I was now a bishop. So he came to me and said, Bishop, do you remember such and such a time? I said, yes. And then they said, do you know we wanted to kill you? I said, why? They said, we wanted you to leave the Land Rover you are driving so that people can fight over it. I said, if that's all, then why didn't you kill me? They said, oh, no, we could not. On your right shoulder was an angel. On your left shoulder, there was an angel. And they were warrior angels. We were so frightened. I said, hallelujah. Now, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear them, fear him to protect them. You actually don't understand that heaven protects you. And they're always in protection. You go to Kampala, you come back. You get into the accident, you don't get hurt. Do you think you're lucky? You are under protection. As you, as you surrender your life to God, as you give God the priority to lead your life, as you allow God to be your guide, as you allow God to lead you, you are on the faculty. Your work will be totally different if Christ is your partner. Because he will help you to handle your students, your subject, eloquently and well. I have been a leader in the church ever since 1979. And I have led the church from a small context to the last bit of it. And I've seen how God can inspire, can give you creativity, can help you to succeed. Because success is his word. If you're a student, you make Christ your partner, he will help you to know how to study and how to remember and how to understand questions and how to answer. He will help you to be a good student who is focused to go beyond this university elsewhere in a higher setting. He will take you through this university, although it's like a, a jungle, you will still succeed and find your way around. And I do know, as a student here, I had a problem. My problem was this. I found theology very dry and boring and difficult. I didn't even know why I was here anyway. One day I decided even to leave. I went to my principal. He told me, why do you want to leave? I said, well, I don't feel I belong here. Why don't you let me go and preach? He said, where do you want to go? I had no idea. What is the message? I had no idea. So I asked him, I said, sir, can you give me some days? I want to go and find out from God if I'm really supposed to be here. He said, you can take it and you can go. By the way, I was a head student here. I was the president of the guild here. So I went out, Kitoshi area. I was there, and I was there for three days until God spoke. I want to ask you young people, as well as the faculty, engage with God at the level where he can talk to you, because he can talk. God brought me Jonah, this prophet. And he asked me, do you know him? I said, yes, I do. Somehow I did, yes. Do you know he's my prophet? I said, yes, I do. Do you know I sent him? I said, yes, you did. Do you know he refused? Simple questions like Nazareth school questions. He refused to go, yes. 
And then he asked me a question which was a bit tougher. Did he ever get to where he wanted to go? And of course not. If you don't know the story, Jonah found himself in the belly of a fish. So then he asked me the next question. Do you want to learn the lesson that Jonah learned? Now that was hard. <laughs> uh, that was hard. I found myself tearing. I said, no, Lord, not me. He said, go back to Mukono. I came back to Mukono, I finished my studies, I was top of my class that year, 1978. Why? Because the Lord enabled me to study and to pass. My colleague said to me, don't joke with Henry, he has a photographic mind. This guy never forgets what he reads. Well, that was not about photographic mind, that was about the power of God that enables me to be a good student. And you can't be a good student. Why not? You can't be a, a, a successful student. Why not? You can pass through this university with first class degree upper. You can get an upper degree as well. You can pass this degree, this, this school, get out of that gate with a desire to always come back. There are people when you go out, you don't want to come back to UCU because you have very bitter memories here. You can be different. And so I want to ask God that if you are a young person, May God make you live long so that you see the goodness of God in the, in the, in the land of the living. May God protect you from premature death which happens today to many young people. If you are in the faculty, may God prosper your work in what you are doing to give you the joy of service. To make you feel I am in the place where I am now and God has given me the opportunity to be in. Relationship that adds value is a relationship when you know you are relating with God and God is on your side. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Who is the enemy that can confront you when you are God is the lion of Judah protecting you day in and day out? The people I want you to listen to, then I want to stop. I wanted to listen to one man called David, who intimately walked with God. And he wrote a beautiful psalm that all of us may understand by now, Psalm 23. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want at all. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Even goes deeper in verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. I want you to come back to look and look at a, a story about the prodigal son who left home, loaded, then he got everything destroyed. Then he was so much in need that he ended up with pigs and no one could give him anything to eat. Then one day he remembered home and he remembered his father and he said, look at me. Back home, my father has servants, they eat and they leave, and I'm dying here with hunger. I'll get up, I'll go back home, and I'll tell my father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your servants. Now, I want you to know that that boy did not end up there. He got up. He did not look it. He was in rags, he was smelling pigs, but he was going home. Perhaps his walking had even changed because he was pigs, and I know pigs and jiggers are very close. May his feet were eaten up by jiggers, but he was going home. He was no longer the handsome, uh, perhaps pushy young man, but cowed, and now he's so humble, but he was going home. And when he got home, father saw him from a distance. That's the bit I love. That's actually the bit that brought me to God. He ran, got his son, kissed him, and then the son began to repeat what he rehearsed over and over. There was no need for that. He said, quick, cover his nakedness. Bring the best robe, put it on him now. That is what God does to anybody who makes a choice to come home. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where you are, who you are, what you have been doing yesterday, what you have been doing this morning. You may be filth, you may be in total denial of everything else. But when you come back home, the arms are open. He embraces you. He clothes you of your, of your nakedness and reinstates you. Again, he was talking to his disciples according to John chapter 15 and verse 15. He says this, I no longer call you servants. 
I call you friends. I call you friends. For all that the Father commanded me, I have shared with you. Friends of Jesus, let's stand up. Let me thank you and pray for you. Friends of Jesus, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and graves to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, oh what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything I want to say thank you Lord God standing before you Father are your people I believe very strongly a number of them have not yet connected with you to find you as a friend, as a savior of their lives, as a burden carrier of their hearts. You are a friend who sticks closer to us than a brother. A number of us, Lord, we have been betrayed, broken relationship, broken promises, we are so disappointed with people in what they say to us and our hearts are raw, our hearts are in pain, our hearts are disappointed. But there is a friend who knows how to mend hearts, who knows how to heal wounds that are deep in us. His name is Jesus. Father, there are those who are totally lost because they are alone here in this big university People are not caring a lot. People may never even touch them. They are afraid. They do not know what to do. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to hold their hands now and tell them I am here and I am your friend. I brought you here and I will take you through. There are those whose bodies have struggled with so much pain and struggled because perpetual sicknesses commonly called malaria and all those which come with typhoid fever and perhaps hepatitis B those very strange things bother you and a lot of it could be the work of the enemy to slow your progress in life there is one who is called Jesus and is the healer may he touch your body even this afternoon and restore you to perfect health. But at this moment, I am asking you to make a choice because it is your time to make a choice. To make a choice to take Christ into your life, whether you're a young person or an old person, that he who has stretched his arms to you and calls you, come, come to me, come follow me, and I will change your destiny. To those people along the Sea of Galilee, from fishermen who wanted to make them fishers of men. But for you, it may be totally different. That your unsure future will be established even today, this afternoon. That we'll know where he's taking you himself because he knows the way. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There are quite a number of you who walked with him once upon a time, but now your faith is gone, now your faith is called, now your faith no longer means anything to you. Prayer is difficult, Bible study is difficult, and you don't understand what is going on. Let me say to you, he's a God of a second chance. He will restore you, and he will heal you and bring you back. I also sense there are people here who struggle because they're orphans. 
There is vulnerability in their hearts. There is hopelessness in their tomorrow. And perhaps they are even bitter with God for taking their loved ones, their mommy, their daddy, the people who supported them. Let me assure you, God knows why you are still alive. And this afternoon is going to be your father. It's going to be your mother. It's going to be your friend. It's going to restore your heart that fear may no longer rule you. That you will never walk in self-pity because you have lost your dear one. Because he is always with those who come back to him. And then some people here, you need power to excel. The Lord is the one who can give you the power that you need. Some people here, you need a helper in terms of finances. Again, me, I will never rule out the fact that cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. The earth and all that is it belongs to the Lord. Surely there will be a way for you. Surely it did not bring you here to tease you. Did not bring you here to make fun of you. He brought you here so that he can demonstrate his power in your life. And so if you want to make a decision to come and make Jesus your friend, I want you to pray. And pray loudly so that God who knows your heart knows what is coming out of your mouth is coming from your heart. Making a public confession of your deep need to him as we sit, as we stand together as a family. Say to him, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that today I stand here as a living person. I have listened to your word and I have received your word. That I need a helper. I need a savior. I need a friend. I need somebody to walk with me. Somebody to show me a direction. Father, forgive me where I have let you down, will you restore me back to yourself and give me a relationship again to be your child, walking in confidence and in the assurance that you live for me. Amen. Thank you.